So my name is Andy McGrath, I'm a colorectal surgeon based here at Leicester Royal Infirmary. Um, I have an interest in surgical education and education in terms of uh, non-technical skills and human factors. So Zoe has asked me this afternoon to talk to you a little bit about non-technical skills and their interaction uh, with your sort of day-to-day -day work life, your technical skills that you employ on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to give you sort of a half hour talk about that. If people want to put in and ask questions while we're going along, feel free. Um, I might ask you a few questions or a few ideas as we go along. So hopefully it will be of use to you. Take two, as I say, Zoe's asked me to talk to you a little bit about non-technical skills. So have the next slide, please, Ricky or Mike. So a common misunderstanding is that human factors and non-technical skills are interchangeable terms and they're not. Human factors is a huge topic covering people, cultures, systems, technology, equipment and processes, as I've listed here. And non-technical skills are only one, one part of human factors. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking to you about non-technical skills rather than human factors per se. Next slide. So what are non-technical skills? Well, you can define cognitive and social skills which underpin optimal performance. It's not good enough to be technically proficient at your job. It can't guarantee your patients are safe if you don't have the requisite cognitive skills. So you can be the world's greatest anaesthetist, surgeon, cardiologist, but if you have no technical skill, uh, non-technical skills, you will not perform well and your patients will not be safe. So hopefully I'll be able to show you this by the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So how do we divide non-technical skills up? You can put them into two groups, as I say, cognitive and social. The cognitive skills are situational awareness, knowing what's going on around you and your decision making skills. The social components of non-technical skills are communication and teamwork and leadership. Next slide. And that these are the two I'm going to focus on as I was asked to today, which is situational awareness and communication. Next slide. So why do things go wrong in theatres? As an East Distance Surgeons, we're all around, all over the hospital all of the time, but primarily our work is based in, in theatres. So if anyone has their microphone on, can anyone imagine you're, you're in theatre, it's your theatre list. Why do things go wrong in your theatre list? Anyone want to shout anything out? Dr. Little. Incompetent surgeons. Absolutely, yeah. Surgeon's the primary problem, but if we take the surgeon out of the equation, why, why else do the lists not run as smoothly as they could do? Staffing, someone said, yeah. Pressure of time. Do we always have the notes? Don't have any notes. Disorganised. Last minute changes. All of these things. If poor you're communication. Be, poor communication, yeah. OK, I can't see if anyone's on. So next slide. So the list that often gets generated, and this is true whichever audience I'm talking to, whether it be anaesthetist, surgeons, cardiologist, orthopods, whoever it may be, the list always seems to be pretty much the same. So things go wrong because of pressure of time. We get distracted, last minute changes on the list, inadequate preparation. We don't have the notes. We make assumptions. The kit doesn't work. We haven't got the right drugs, inadequate health, or as many people do, we just blame the system because the system's always wrong and it never works. So the one thing that we missed from this, if you look at this list, the, the content of this list is all non-technical. So at no point when people generate this list, which usually takes about two minutes, does anyone actually say it's because I'm technically the world's worst surgeon or I'm the world's worst anaesthetist. So it's never about the technical skills. Everyone instantaneously blames everything else, but never mentions technical skills. And the big thing that's missing from this list is us as the, me as the medics. So we are partly responsible for things that go wrong. Next slide, please. And that's because if you've read the checklist manifesto by Atul Gawande, he made a very sensible statement or a very sweeping statement, which is we all make errors irrespective of how much training and experience we possess or how motivated we are to do the right thing. Because we all come to work to do the right thing. But despite that work ethic and ethos, things do go wrong. Next slide. Because we're good at doing most of the things most of the time, but we're not good at doing all of them all of the time. So we are fallible because we are humans. Next slide, please. 
and that's why it was quite interesting when you see if you work through the actual uh, logistics and and figures from the checklist manifesto when the when the checklist first came in it was published he was heard to say I couldn't believe the outcomes could be so much better without any change to the skill set of the individual simply by talking to each other checking we had the right kits checking we had the right patient actually agreeing what we were going to outcomes improved complications dropped and mortality dropped no one's read the checklist manifesto it's a good book it's about seven pounds fifty last time I looked on Amazon which you can order so a simple easy read slide please and so because of these constant things going wrong we get never events never events by their name are badly named because they always occur they did never not never occur okay this figures these slightly out of date but this is pre-covid um so 600 never events report in england over a 15 month period if you look at the more recent figures it's already about 400 there were 400 between march last year and april this year so despite everything never events still continue to happen never events such as wrong site surgery wrong prosthesis wrong drugs retain swabs ng tubes in the wrong place we keep doing them because we're human not because we're rubbish at our jobs next slide please so what all this is about it's not about picking on people who are bad it's not about people who need remediation and training it's not about the weird and the wonderful the catastrophic failures or blaming people um, next slide please it's about this it's about normal people because this happens every day to normal people normal hospitals on a day-to-day -day basis using normal systems um, sometimes it's due to failure of recognition of complexity that we do and we're trying to optimize performance by maximizing our non-technical skills which will complement our technical skills next slide please so the first thing we're going to talk about is situational awareness simple and easy knowing what's going on around you and this is a paraphrase of Misha Ensley's work from 2000 so if you have situation awareness, it means you know what's going on around you next slide she set up a very simple model which was a three level model of situational awareness perception comprehension and projection so level one what what's going on around you comprehension level two so what so what's it mean and level three now what so your situation awareness you can actually assess someone on their uh, levels of situation awareness level one what's going on two what does it mean and three now what i'm going to do okay and unless you have good situation awareness you you will fail to make decisions you'll struggle to make decisions or you might make the wrong decision next slide please so i'm going to pick on you mike you might have seen this slide before because i know you're going to talk what can you see in this picture what can you uh, i'm going to guess there's going to be a small child that's going to run out from somewhere because of football in the middle of the road okay so you what what have you seen why are you saying that well that's based on the, the football in the middle of the road okay you're in what looks to be a residential street lots okay. of cars that are parked on one side and a free running car on the other side okay. assuming worst case scenario the ball's bouncing from uh from right to left yeah um and they're just not they're not going to look of course so, it might be none of that no absolutely so the most obvious thing you can see on there is a is a football in the middle of the screen I'm just showing the people here uh football in the middle of the screen so your level one situation awareness is good in that you've spotted the football so that's the what so the so what what does it mean it's likely that there's a small child going to be following that so there might be a small child running out might be running out between those so and now what so what does that mean to the person driving the mpv coming in the other direction it means they're likely to slow down so they will have actions as a consequence of level one situation awareness they, they can see what's going on they understand what it means and therefore they act on it so level three situation awareness would mean that you actually take preventative action and slow down so if you look at that picture there are a lot of things going on as well there's there's two or three houses that are up for sale so there might be people walking around there if you look on the left hand right hand side of the screen is a yellow van that looks like it's parked up with people standing next to it so there's a whole lot of things going on other than the blinding the obvious so if i ask you the point what's the most commonly missed fracture i know we're not orthopods we're all anaesthetists in this audience apart from me as a general surgeon so what's the most commonly missed fracture any ideas anyone want to shout out 
No, nope. so the commonly missed fracture is the second fracture. OK, because we find the first one and everyone goes, oh, there's my job, I'm all sorted. So the blind in the obvious is often what's going on, but you have to look a little bit further than that. So your situation awareness is not just about one thing. So in this picture, you're looking at the ball. The primary problem is the ball bouncing. A child might run out and they might get run over unless the, the great silver car coming towards you slows down. But there is an awful lot going on in this picture when you look at it. Um, so you need to think about other things. So it's not just the blind in the obvious. Next slide, please. So loss of situation awareness. When there is a loss of situation awareness, when people look back and do uh, root cause analyses of problems, they will often you'll often hear these phrases. So next slide, just work through these. There's about five of them, Ricky. So I didn't realise that. We were very surprised when I didn't notice that. Next one. I was so busy attending to something else. And next one, I wasn't aware of that. So you commonly hear these phrases when things go wrong because you are completely oblivious to what's going on around you. You're so focused on your task, you miss everything else. OK, so your situation awareness disappears. And that's when problems happen. Next slide, please. We were convinced that. So the, the obligatory airline pilot picture. I appreciate that everyone's sick and tired of hearing about how good the airline industry is. The reason I put this slide up is simply because they've been doing this for about 50 years. So they are about 35, 40 years ahead of us. The NHS keeps talking about learning from its mistakes and learning from errors, but it never seems to. The airline industry, although uh, many people would say it's more straightforward in that you get in a plane, you fly a plane from A to B, whereas when you do an operation, you have a different patient on a different day in a different theatre with a different team with different equipment and different pathologies. So it's medicine is more complex than flying a plane, you could argue. Um, the my answer to that would be if the airline industry can sort it for there, we should be even better than the airline industry. We do, if we know that we're dealing with more complex problems, we should be dealing on a level much higher than the airline industry, yet we, we still fail to do that. So next slide, please. So have a read of this. Um, or for those who can't see it, LRI, I'll read it out. A DC-9 was, was descending towards Charlotte in patchy fog. During the approach, the crew discussed politics, used cars and, and the US economy. Two minutes before touchdown, the conversation in the cockpit switched to the identification of a local amusement park, which they just passed. Shortly after receiving their final clearance, the captain remarked, all we've got to do now is find the airport. What do you think happened next? Next slide, please, Ricky. So three seconds later, they crashed the plane. 72 people died because they weren't actually had any interest in what they were doing, which is flying the plane. The National Transport Safety Board in 1974, so this happened in 1974, subsequent to that grounded all the DC-9s and a huge investigation took place. And the outcome of that was that there was poor cockpit uh, form. So people were discussing and chatting about things they shouldn't have been chatting about rather than focusing on the task. And subsequent to that, they brought in next slide, please. Subsequent to that, next slide. We'll move. Uh, they brought in a concept called sterile cockpit. So cognitive threats and distractions. So if you look at this slide, along the bottom is the in percentages. You can see several columns in percentages and numbers. That's the amount of time that the plane spends in these particular areas. Across the top are the percentages of airline crashes that happen in those. So if you look at the bottom, 2% of the time it's spent taking off or taxing, yet almost 25% of crashes happen there. You go to the right hand side of the screen, landing and approach accounts for over 30% of crashes, and yet that is only 4% of the time in there. Okay, so landing the plane is dangerous, taking off the plane is dangerous, once you're in the air it's not too bad. So what the airline industry have brought in is a thing called sterile cockpit, which means about 10,000 feet is cruising height for many planes. So once, if you're below 10,000 feet, you're not allowed to talk about anything other than, patient, than cockpit safety. So if you're in the, in the cockpit, that's all you talk about till 10,000 feet is reached and then you can talk about anything. Similarly, when you descend below 10,000 feet, again, all bets are off. You have to talk about the safety of the plane. OK, next slide, please. So this really pertains to us in theatres, so anaesthetic manoeuvres. So you guys all hate the surgeons when we all chat and laugh and joke about when you're putting the patients to sleep because the patient needs some quiet. The last thing that goes is their hearing, so they will hear everything. So understandably, a sterile cockpit moment for anaesthetist is putting the patient to sleep or actually waking the patient up, and that should be 
all bets should be off. We shouldn't be talking about anything else because you guys are concentrating on focusing on that. If it becomes a complex problem for the surgeon, undoubtedly the surgeon will ask for some quiet and we'll, we'll hopefully get quiet from everybody else because that's the moment that the surgeon's having its sterile cockpit moment and needs focus and concentration. We all ignore the nurses at the end um, and often the prosthesis there, but the, the, the swab count and the sharp count at the end is the most important part of the day for the scrub team because they have to get it right. How many times do you see the surgeon leaning across and going, I'm just going to take this instrument, I'm just going to put the drain in, I'm just going to take this swab off you. Or the anaesthetic team coming around and I'm just going to give you some local for the for the blocks. The nurses are through the through the count, they're going one, two, three, four, five, and you come and go, I'm just going to give you some local anaesthetic. Oh, I can't remember what number I was on, I'm back to one again. The surgeons lean over and take stuff, so it's very easy to distract people. Anaesthetic manoeuvres, we should all be quiet. Complex surgical manoeuvres, we should all be quiet. And the time out, the sort of the swab count for the nurses at the end of the day should be the, should be silent, silent as well. Sterile cockpit is a concept that you need to talk about and you need to have in your team brief at the beginning so people people know what it means. There's no point shouting, I'm calling sterile cockpit and everyone looks at you like you're a nutter because you don't, they don't know what it means. A colleague in the north of England, he uses the phrase pink flamingo. So that's what they use in their theatre. So he shouts pink flamingo and it means everyone stops looks at that individual because they know there's a problem and this is going to be a sterile cockpit moment. I need everyone to focus, I need everyone to be on the ball and I need to need your help. So anybody can call this, but you've got to have this outlined at the beginning of the day. So it's a very sensible and easy thing to do as long as your team know what it means. And you can choose whatever phrase you want because people don't like cockpits because it's, it's aviation, not medicine. Next slide, please. So in the north of England, in Lancashire, they use, if in there, call it out, so they use 10,000 feet because of the sterile cockpit. Above 10,000 feet you can chat, below 10,000 feet you talk about plane, plane safety. So in East Lancashire, if anyone has a problem, they will call 10,000 feet. They say, I'm calling 10,000 feet. Everyone stops, looks at that individual to say, right, what's the problem? How can we help? And so you use a phrase that your team knows about. Next slide, please. So how can you enhance situation aware? So how can you make your ability to understand what's going on around you, appreciate what it means and what you need to do about it? There's a click through a few of these, Ricky. So pre-task briefing. Keep going, have a pre-task briefing, sit at the beginning, work out what you're going to do, plan the day out. Um, there's nothing worse than having a day in theatre where things don't work and it's usually because no one's communicating what they think. Assumptions are made, I'm assuming that Anistas knows what they're doing, they're assuming I know what I'm doing, it may be it may be wrong, I might have not done the case for many, many months and it's I'm going to struggle with it, but if I, unless I tell someone that, they don't know. We assume that the nurses have got all the equipment that I want because they're mind readers and I bother to tell them so things so pre-task briefing is good because it, it focuses everyone's attention. Sterile cockpit moment we've mentioned scanning techniques getting people to look round. if you've got a good team they will be checking out for you. Um, it's not unusual for me to say in theatres if I look like I'm doing something stupid it's probably because I am. So if someone sees me doing something stupid, can you please tell me? Because I'm probably not aware of it because I'm doing it. If it's stupid, I shouldn't be doing it. But if I'm doing it and it carrying on, look like I'm going to carry on because I don't, I'm not aware of it and I've lost my situation awareness. Might be I'm so task focused on some bleeding or whatever it might be that I'm unaware of what else is going on. OK, so getting your team to scan and actively gather information, try and help you is good. Making sure you're healthy and well. Keep clicking, Ricky. Ask other team members to cross check, recheck information. If you disrupt, if you're going through a checklist and you get disrupted, go back to the beginning, OK? Because we are never, we never go back to where we think we've gone. The worst case scenario of this was Cypriot Airline. Um, they were doing the pre-flight checks. They went through the pre-flight checks. They got interrupted by the, uh, by the telecom tower. They went back to where they thought. They stopped the check. They then took off. What they'd failed to do in their checklist, they'd missed out. They'd forgot to pressurise the plane. So they took off in an unpressurised plane and everybody died. So the entire plane took off all perfectly well once they got to a level where they became hypoxic. No one had pressurised the plane, so everybody passed out through hypoxia and died. And it wasn't until the plane crashed that anybody knew about this. So we are very bad at missing things out. So if you do get interrupted in a checklist, go back to the beginning. Don't think you know where you are. It's much easier to go back to the beginning and check it. Open questions are much better than I'm doing the right thing, aren't I? Because the answer, immediate answer is course you are, you're the consultant. Never assume that you know what you're talking about. Always ask open questions and try and get everybody to speak up in the team. That's the whole point of 
everyone talking and introducing themselves at the beginning of a checklist is if you do that, people are much more likely to speak up. OK, so the reason we introduce ourselves in the morning. Hi, I'm Andy, I'm the surgeon. I'm Dave, I'm the ODP. I'm Louise, I'm the scrub nurse for the day, whoever it may be. If you've actually been introduced, you're much more likely to have a conversation or speak up if you see something going wrong. Next slide, please. And yeah, we're not all perfect. We all make errors, as I said right at the beginning. Next slide, Ricky. OK, so communication, so situation awareness in a nutshell. Again, there are theses, there are books written on situation awareness. That's a very quick fly through. Communication, which is the second area is only wanted me to talk about. Effective communication and teamwork are essential for patient safety and quality of care. Breakdowns are common and commonly lead to poor patient outcomes. OK, and those those incidents are often because of a breakdown between healthcare professionals who are either in a bad mood, not wanting to talk to someone because they don't like them, or between healthcare professionals and patients. So we, we often get emotional and that emotion then drives how we communicate. Trying to take the emotion out of everything is much a much better way of dealing with the day. Next slide, please. So where and when do we communicate? As I say, anaesthetists and surgeons are often around the hospital more so than other medical teams based on wards, theatres, clinic, we end up in ED, meetings, teaching. So we communicate an awful lot with each other. And it's important that if someone talks to you, you listen to them. So has anybody got any ideas? If I was, I'm going to select someone sitting next to me. So if I was really, really interested in listening to what you have to tell me, how long do you think I'd listen to you for? If you're talking to me, how, how long is it before I'm going to start getting bored? <laughs> Less than that, it's about 30 seconds. So if I'm really interested in what someone's telling me, I'm probably going to listen to them for about 30 seconds. And then what I'm going to start doing is gap searching. So I'm going to wait for you to go and then I'm in because I want to be heard and I want to say something. So if you you can imagine if you're transmitting any information that's useful or important, you've got to do it in short, precise, concise manner. Just transfer the information. We don't want a whole lot of flannel or waffle because humans humans got things out and we want to be heard all the time. We all want to be in charge. We all want to speak. So when you listen to someone, you've actually got to actively listen. It's a skill. Just hearing someone going on in the background will don't will will shut them out and drone them out because we're not interested. Next slide, please. So the components of communication are you need to exchange. The reason we communicate is because we're exchanging information. When we exchange that information, what it allows us to do is to, establish a shared understanding between the team. So if you impart information, you're, it's simply to, to let your team know what you're thinking and then you're all on the same page. Once you can do that, you can then coordinate your team, work out what's going on. And there are times everyone talks about losing the hierarchy gradients in theatres on the wards in ITU. There are times where authority and assertiveness are required. Um, when things go wrong, someone needs to be in charge. But most of the time we try and keep a level a level layer so you've not got the boss up here and the trainees down here or the nurses it's all on a, on a similar level okay next slide please ricky so all of these things exchanging information establishing a shared understanding coordinating your team and authority are all enhanced by having a brief at the beginning of the day going through your checklist because everybody knows the patients the right patient we've got the right kit we know we're doing the right operation at the right time on the right day for the right reason Feedback and readback, um, much better in the military. If you look, there are entire books on, on aviation English. We are very colloquial in how we communicate with each other. Although, we, although we're all studying medicine, how many times you've been in theatre? If I've worked with an anaesthetic team before, I might say I've got a little bit of bleeding from the spleen. I think we'll be OK. Does that actually give you any useful information? Not really. I'd be much better by saying there's a small nick in the lateral edge of the spleen. I've lost about 20 mils of blood. I'm probably going to lose about 50 mils of blood before I can stop it. That's a very precise way of doing it. It's a bit like saying you wouldn't expect the military to say, OK, we've got a, a mission tomorrow. We're going about, I don't know, about 10 miles away, somewhere over that way. Uh, there might be people with some guns. May not be. I think that would probably be OK, I would have thought. Wouldn't happen, would it? It wouldn't happen. The military would just go, what are you talking about? It would be very precise, very clear, very concise. This is what we're doing. This is where we're going. This is when we're doing it. And this is what's going to happen. So we are so read back and feedback like the, like the airline in aviation. When you listen to airline pilots talking to the comms tower, we want you to turn to 270 degrees east. The pilot will read back, go turning 270 degrees east. So they'll read back, which means one, I've heard you and two, I'm confirming that's what I'm doing. 
So we don't do read back and feedback, which we should do, which would be very good. Teams that function well and communicate well will debrief at the end of the day. The debrief is the hardest thing to do at the end of the day because everyone wants to leave. Patients waking up, anaesthetics are concentrating on that. The surgeons want to write the op note and get out the doors. The nurses want to clear up and the theatre team want to go home. So actually trying to get your team together at the end of the day and have a debrief is very difficult, but it's by far the best thing to do to work out. And it should be done on every day. It shouldn't just be done when days are bad. It should be done when everything's gone well. So if you've had a day that is the best day you've ever had in theatre, you should sit down and say, why did it go so well? So you can repeat it. OK, team training does work. Next slide. So be clear and concise. Think before you speak. OK, so as my grandfather used to say to me. Open your mouth, don't open your mouth until you know what you're going to say. Let them think you're stupid rather than confirming it. OK, so think before you open your mouth. If you plan what you're going to say, you will usually give a clear, concise message. and It will be the message that you want to convey. OK, S bar, we all know what S bar stands for. Yes. Yep, situation, background, action response common language you try and try and have a common language this was particularly true uh, with covid some of these slides have come from covid because when we first started we all had face masks on we had hoods on we had entire faces covered up and you're trying to do an emergency operation um and you're you're at a point where you need short short words you agree the words beforehand in your brief to say this is what if i show you this hand signal this is what i mean is this a 2-0 2 suture i'm using scissors I'm using a suture needle. You can agree them with your scrub team. You can agree them with your ODP, but you've got to do it. And there's got to be a limited number. You don't. You just want simple, easy instructions. Next slide, please. Ensure that you've been heard. So speak up. We're all wearing masks now. Hopefully you can hear me, but you're in theatre. There's a whole lot of extraneous noise. If we're all wearing masks, hoods, FFP3, whatever it might be, people struggle to hear. And a lot of people do, do hear by watching people's mouths as well. So if you've got slightly impaired hearing, you are reliant on watching someone's mouth. You can't see the mouth anymore, so therefore your ability to understand what someone's saying to you can, can dra dramatically drop, OK? Minimise noise and distractions. If you're going to use technology, as we've shown today, it's fantastic when it works well. It's not working too well at the moment, but don't do anything different. Yeah. As clinicians, we are, as surgeons outside of theatre, we're doing video consultations, we're doing telephone consultations, we're using online interpreters, so we're having three-way conversations with interpreters. I've just done a clinic this morning where I had a Cantonese interpreter on one phone, the relatives on another phone and me on another phone, trying to have a three-way conversation about someone's cancer. Makes it more difficult, but you've got to make sure your technology works before you do it. But just do what you do normally. Don't try and be clever and change what you do because you'll start making mistakes and missing things out. Next slide, please. So external communication barriers, as I've said, all these masks that we're now having to wear because of COVID. If you speak in a low voice and you mumble and you're now having to wear a mask or you've got a hood on, people won't hear you. Lack of visual cues. And we're now doing things as I say, we're on the telephone, we're on videos, we're speaking to people in different hospitals over, over lines that might not be that clear. Internal in barriers to communication. Next slide. Language. This is a picture which many of you will have seen. Previously, this, this came out the day after Brexit was announced. Um, the NHS is a multicultural society. It's a, it's a group of individuals who work from many, many places around the world and we all work very well together. But language may be a problem. It may not be the first language of English. People deaf, motivation, if they've had poor experiences before, why should I bother doing this? It didn't work out last time. No one listened to me. Cultural status, past experiences and what your mood is like on the day. The uh, airline industry again have a comment. They they have their bucket. They leave the bucket on the on the land on the plane. When they get onto the steps, they leave the bucket. Empty your bucket. Your bucket is. I'm not in a good mood. I've had an argument with my wife, my partner, my whoever it might be. I've run out of money. I couldn't get into the car park. The car was not working. Didn't sleep well last night. Leave all that behind because if you take that baggage with you into whatever you're going to do, your performance will drop off because that is a non-technical impact on you. Okay. So empty your bucket before you go and do something. I don't read emails now before I go to theatre because they make me annoyed and therefore I don't perform as well. So on the day I operate, I don't look at anything before I start operating. I used to read all my emails, come in early, do all the emails. There's been a couple of instances where I know I've been in a bad mood and my performance has not been as good as it could have been simply because I was in a bad mood. So if you're emotional, get rid of the emotion before you start doing anything. Next slide, please. 
coordinating team activities. OK, teams work well when they have a shared mental model. So when everybody knows what they're doing, so you get that from the team brief. Everybody knows what their roles are and what their responsibilities are. And you've got backup behaviours, which means by that I mean if someone sees something going wrong, they're not going to stand there and go, well, hey, Andy Miller anyway, because he's always moaning at me, so I'm not, I don't care what he's doing. I'll just let him struggle. Backup behaviours mean if someone sees something going wrong, like me saying in the team brief, oh, I'm doing something stupid, please tell me. So your team back you up and say, Mr. Miller, you're doing something stupid. Oh, yeah, you're right, I am. So backup behaviours. And you also evaluate team performance. So that's a debrief. At the end of the day, so I've put down here Salas 2004, Eduardo Salas. If you want to read anything about team activities and how teams work well, read anything that Eduardo Salas has written. OK, he uh, is responsible for the team team performance and team evaluation for NASA and the American military. So he's got a fairly good pedigree track record. Um, interesting reading, but a nice guy. Next slide, please. So communication is a skill. We all need to practice it throughout our careers. Be kind and civil. So hands, face, space and kindness really is COVID is, is still here. Um, we all know that it's causing problems and people's fuses are a little shorter. We are a little less courteous to our colleagues because we are frustrated. Next slide, please. Remember to be kind. So I think that is a very good George Bernard Shaw said it best. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. OK, we think we've communicated with something. Because we don't do read back feedback, we have no idea whether anyone listened to us. The number of times I've said in theatre, can someone remind me to take the drain, to take the swab out at the end? Who am I talking to? Unless you actually look at someone and say X or Y, I'll use your name, Mike, because you're on the or you're on the call. So Mike, can you remind me to take the swab out at the end? Yes, Andy, I'll remind you to take the swab out at the end. Read back feedback. That's been accepted. Mike's heard me. He's accepted the challenge to say, yes, I'll remind you and it, it will happen. If I just mumble, can someone remind me to take the swap out? Everyone's in theatre going, who's he talking to? Does he mean me? Does he mean someone else? So unless you are specific, the illusion is I've communicated. I think I've told everybody and can't understand why no one's helping me. So it is often an illusion that it's taken place. Next slide, please. This is a little bit of facts and figures. Communication failures. Laurie Lee Lingard is a, is a psychologist who looked at observed behaviours in, in an operating theatre. Um, and she did this over a couple of weeks and found in the communications that you observed, the content of the communication was insufficient or inaccurate in almost half of the cases. So people didn't impart the right information. The audience was missing, so that would be uh, akin to the team brief at the beginning. There's no point having a team brief if your entire team's not there. The course of your team's missing, they will not understand what's going on. You won't have a shared mental model, the day won't work and your team won't coordinate. The purpose was unclear, so people mumbling, not really saying why they're talking a third of the time and the occasion. OK. Problems in a situation of context information transfer, so the wrong occasion, just as things are going pear shaped or you're struggling with an airway is not the time to say, can I just talk to you about my training? And I just ask you if there's bleeding in the pelvis, someone suddenly wants to have a conversation with me about their multi source feedback. Not perfect timing, so pick your time for communication. But communication failures are very, very common, as you can see. Next slide, please. So this is a, although it's a surgical publication, this is actually, this is retrospectively looked at in patients who'd actually sustained injuries. So these are successful litigants. So these patients have actually sued the hospitals, been successful in that. Um, and in those 60 patients, it was shown that in 49% of 49% of the cases whose patients sustained an injury, poor transfer of information. OK, 44% inaccurately received. So we thought we told the patients, but we hadn't. So they misunderstood or we didn't check that they understood what we meant. And 7% they didn't even hear what we said. OK, so communication is not just about putting percentages on there. It does actually have impacts on patient patients outcomes. So patients get injured because we don't communicate the right information. We what we do communicate is in, incorrect. Next slide, please. So. I think this is a very, very powerful and good slide. OK, people forget what you said to them, but they'll, they won't forget how you make them feel. So if you're rude, snappy. People may not say I can't remember what he said to me, but he made me feel awful. They will remember that and they, that will be that, that will come back into the slides I put previously of motivation. If I've been rude to someone. No one's going to help me. So he was rude to me last time. Why should I help him? And that 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 memory stays for a long, long time. OK, so be careful how you speak to people. Next slide, please. 
How do we improve communication? Never assume that what you've said has been heard. You need to check, be precise in what you say. Pick your moment. S bar is useful. Verify information has been received, and that's what we don't do, and I think that's what we should be doing. And if you're, and if the, the if if when you ask questions, the answers coming back, you just go, well, it just sounds ridiculous. It's not because the person's stupid; it's because they haven't understood what you've asked them to do. So if something comes back and it sounds stupid, just clarify and say, just check what the, what what the patient actually, the person actually understands. Next slide, please. So very briefly, last few slides, and then I'll stop talking at you. Um, our memory systems are in two. We've got a working memory and a long-term memory. The green box at the front is your working memory. People say you can hold up to seven or eight pieces of information. More recent evidence would suggest it's probably four or five, which is why people chunk up their mobile phones. They don't rattle no, off no. a whole massive number of, I do four, three and four, because we can remember three or four pieces of information. Okay, Finite amount there. It helps with our decision making. It's a finite capacity, but it's very, very easy to interfere with our working memory. So this is the this is the part of the memory when the scrub nurses are doing the count at the end and they are on 14 for the 14th needle and you go, could I just? Very easily distracted. They go back to the beginning because they can't remember what number they've just said, even though they're encountered to 14 or 10 or 12. So it's very easy to disrupt it. A long term memory is where all our experiences are, and where we keep dipping into. I've seen this before. This is what we're going to do with pattern recognised. Next slide, please. So every day at work for you guys and everybody else, anyone ever been at work where they've been distracted, fatigued, overworked, equipment doesn't work, hungry, stressed, that ever happened to anybody? Every day of the week. So all of those factors, next slide please, stress you out, so it means your green box shrinks. So if you are hungry, tired, angry, late, worried, stressed, overworked, getting 15 phone calls, your page is going and you get just leave me alone. Your green box starts to shrink. So your ability to hold information gets smaller and smaller. And your ability to make decisions gets smaller and smaller. Your green box shrinks to a certain size. You get to the point where you can't do anything and you just freeze. You become incapable of making a decision. OK, so when you get stressed and worried, you just go, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. Your green box gets smaller and smaller and you end up in a think do conundrum. OK, next slide, please. And the think do conundrum, you've all seen it, but I will remind you if you haven't seen it, just a routine operation, Elaine Bromley. All seen it, all watch the video. Think do conundrum. So, okay, so you, you, we all want to do things. So, the more we do things, the more stress we get because we're not achieving what we want to do. So, our green box starts to shrink. Because we start to shrink our green box, we can't then think. So, we can't think, so we do more stuff. And we just get more and more extremes. We get out to the extreme where you go, I can't do it anymore because I'm trying to do everything and it's not working. But I'm trying hard, so hard to do that, I can't even think straight. So you get to the point where you go, I can't do anything. Think, do, can under, and you freeze, which is exactly what happened in the, in the Elaine Bromley video when you watch it, is that people just went, I'll oh, just keep doing the same thing. They're obviously clearly not thinking because we're just, I'll just try and intubate, I'll keep trying to intubate, I'll keep doing it, it didn't work, I'll keep, someone else comes and goes, well, I'll have a go. And it's just they're just trying to do stuff because they can't stop and think of what you need at that point is someone overseeing you go. So everyone just stop for 10 seconds and we'll just think. If you stop then your green box starts to expand because you're not doing anything and you start being able to think things through. So taking 10 seconds will probably save you several minutes or even someone's life. OK, sometimes you can't stop doing things if you're dealing with a difficult airway. Your green box is shrinking. You've got to go. You've got to deal with the difficult airway. But there are several green boxes in the room. Surgical team, ODP, script team. All of those people have green boxes. You can go. Can you do this, this, and this, please? I, I don't need to think about that. Delegate task. Your green box starts to get bigger because you're now not having to think about these other three things. Might be I'm doing some bleeding in the pelvis and go. For the next five minutes, I'm off. I'm off grid. I'm just dealing with this. If anyone rings, does anything, any decisions need to be made, I'm not making them. Can you do that? And I might be talking to the consultant anesthetist. Say, so I'm now, my green box is focused short, purely on this task. OK, so share the green box around. Next slide, please. Next slide, because that doesn't work. It was a small video of someone fishing and it gets eaten by an orca. Fishing and it comes out and just gets so startled, recovering from startled. We're all startled at times. So, 
you as you get more senior, you may be called into a problem in A&E, you may be called into theatres, you might be called into ITU where you get called in as the expert. You get called and go, we need some help, we're going to ring so and so. You come in and the first thing you need to do is make sure that the rest of that team is OK. If you've been involved in it, you need to reboot. So am I OK? Am I actually capable of carrying on here? Do I need five minutes out or 10 seconds out to get my green box to, sh to get back to a size where I can actually think? Check your team, check the environment and work out what you're going to do. So step reboot. Next slide, please. Let's say often we are often hungry, angry, late and tired, all in combination. OK, the commonest is hangry. I've never breakfast or I've missed my lunch and I'm not happy. So I'm hungry and I'm angry, so I'm hangry. OK, if you are any one of these, you are eight times more likely to do something stupid. OK, so if you're on your way to theatre and you're, you're angry, try and get rid of the anger before you get there. If you're hungry, have some food. If you're late, don't rush there, then go straight into it. Get there, arrive, apologise, take two minutes to calm down because things will work a lot better. That two minutes will save you an awful lot of time. But if you rush in and try and do stuff, everything will go wrong. You get more irritated, your green box will shrink, you get more angry, you won't be able to think about anything and nothing will work. So hangry is not a good thing. Next slide, please. Check yourself. I'm safe. Am I unwell? Am I on any medications? Am I stressed? Abuse could be anything. That could be bullying, could be drugs, whatever. Am I exhausted? Often. Am I emotional? OK, so think about is your your personal performance. This, your, this is your responsibility and you need to communicate this to the team. So if you're not right, you need to tell the team. Don't assume that everyone's going to go. If it's me, I'm a, I've had no sleep all night. I've been up all night operating. I'm on call. I come in and I'm in a bad mood. I can assume that everybody knows I'm in a bad mood and everyone knows that I'm not right and everyone knows that I'm not going to perform very well. The likelihood is no one's even noticed. I assume they have, but no one's probably noticed. OK, so don't assume. So if you're not right, you need to tell someone. Next slide, please. So your green box shrinks. So if someone's rude to you, your green box will shrink. OK, your green box, if you observe someone being shouted out. So if I start shouting at you over here and we all watch that, all of our green boxes are going to shrink. So it's not just the individual who's being shouted at or abused or bullied. It's everyone who witnesses it. So if you do that in a team, in theatres, someone shouts at someone else, the entire team performance drops. OK, so be very conscious and be very aware of that. Next slide, please. You're rude because your boss is rude. So we all do that because we model and we mirror what our seniors do. OK, an old story that I told before is I, when I was training in Leeds, there was a scrub sister who'd been a scrub sister for at least 30 years and she was very, very good at telling, predicting where the trainees had just been. So you came into St James's or the LGI and she would know which team you'd been working with for the last six months because she'd been there long enough that she trained most of the consultants, surgeons, but the behaviour of the trainees mirrored what those bosses were like. So we do. So medical students mirror the F1s, the F1s mirror the F2s. Registrars will behave how their seniors are and how their consultants are. So if you're rude, your trainees will think it's absolutely perfectly fine to do that. So they'll be rude. OK, so be very careful how you perform. Next slide, please almost the last slide so impact so if incivility so if you look at someone the impact of someone who's been rude someone's been shouted at and bought down okay these are figures from the nhs 80 percent will lose time worrying about this so if you've been shouted at 80 percent of people will constantly think about it it's, it's that's it's that my angelou picture i won't remember what you said to me but i'll remember how you made me feel so if you feel awful because someone shouted at you you'll spend 80 percent of your time thinking about that which means that's 80% of your time you're not thinking about your job. OK, 75% will go. Uh, what's the point? Come to work and your job performance will be less than it was before because you're not interested. Some people will actually spend all their time trying to avoid the person who shouted at them. So if you know they work on a particular corridor, you may take five corridors to get past that corridor so you don't have to actually bump into them. So you spend all of your time coming up with cunning plans how to get around the hospital, trying not to meet the person who shouted at you. OK, people will take time off work, the quality of their work, they will say, not my problem, I'm not, but I'm just going to turn up, do my job and I'm going home. 25% will bully someone else because they've been bullied themselves, so they'll start shouting at everybody else and almost 10% will leave, which is not a great thing in an NHS that's short of people already. 
So bullying and incivility has a massive impact on our workload and our workforce. Next slide, please. And that was just one slide at the end just to show. So as a finance, it's not just it's not just about people. OK. So that's a study that's an underestimate. They est they've underestimated that the range of that was 1.6 billion to 3.2 billion when they actually looked at that. So 2 billion quid a year is lost by loss in productivity, people resigning, people going, people leaving, people having to pay agency staff because staff get bullied and they leave and say this is not my job. Two billion pounds a year. OK, and that was three years ago. So I imagine it's a lot more by now. Next slide. So <laughs> if you want to do anything about uh, non-technical skills, these are three courses or three courses that do run. They're all run. They're all based around work by Rona Flynn, who is a psychologist who's based at Aberdeen. So AMPS is the first one, which is anaesthetic non-technical skills. These are all online. You can get all these booklets for free. The one in the middle is splints, which is scrub practitioners. And the one on the right hand side is surgeons, which is not non-technical skills for surgeons. So they're all available. Um, next slide, please. If anyone wants to read anything, any of these books are useful. Checklist Manifesto, as I say, is about £7.50 online from Amazon. It's a very easy and quick read. Um, Safety One, Safety Two is a, is, a, is a very interesting book. Black Box Thinking, Matthew Side, I don't know if anyone's read of that. It's all, it's all about behaviour, decision making. If you, want, if you want a book about decision making and how people make decisions, I would read Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, which is the one on the bottom left. OK. Um, the one in the top, which is Thinking Fast and Slow. Daniel Kahneman is a psychologist. He won a Nobel Prize for that book. It's in about eight font. I've had it for nine years and I still haven't finished it yet. OK, I've tried to read it about 10 times and I can't get past page 163 or so now. It's just, you just nod off every night. The same stuff is in, is in Blink, which is by Malcolm Gladwell, 12 font about 300 pages less gives you all the same stuff if you're interested in doing it um, so there are there are lots of books out there lots of things to talk about non-technical skills but the non-technical skills the cognitive and the social skills underpin what you can do technically so just because you're technically gifted doesn't mean you'll you'll be great at your job okay so you've got to concentrate on these things they can all be practiced that's me done ricky now we've got the technology finished excellent thank you very much OK. Has anybody got any questions at all? Because you've got a journal club now, have you? Which I will probably leave and go and do some more work. Uh, Mike, I think Mike's got a question. Come on, no, the ultimate, the ultimate answer I'm looking for, Mr Miller, sorry, Professor Miller, is okay. given that the NHS has done all this work and or ex societies outside of the NHS have done all this work, why do we spend so little time um, on doing practices within our day to day that completely go against what you've just said over the last hour or so. Yeah, exactly. Um, the answer to that is I don't know. There are there are it's 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 led or driven by the higher echelons of the tr of trusts around the country. There are several hospitals around the country who have at least seven or eight uh, patient safety advisors, they have clinic clinicians who are leads for patient safety and these are, they have team training on a monthly basis. So every month there is an afternoon set aside where teams train together, be that the theatre team, which would be ODPs, anaesthetists, scrub nurses and the surgeons, or ED where the entire EDs or medical staff, AMU. So there are pockets of this around the country. Um, it's it's trying to get buy in from the seniors um, and that's the problem is if you have a progressive forward thinking senior management team who sees safety as, a, as an important part of culture um, things will change if it's a tick box exercise which is what it is in many many trusts it's we've had a day's training tick that's a it's it's not a single shot immunity this is something that needs to be practiced and continue to be practiced um, throughout your career um, and just because we can do it one week doesn't mean six months later we're going to be any good at it if we haven't continued to practice it. So frustrating for everybody I think because the, 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 not the zealots but the people who see this as an important thing are often frustrated by the lack of buy-in from other other parts of, of uh, trusts. 
I know that's not the answer that doesn't give doesn't give you a, a fix, but it's sort of it it, uh, it it is an area, and this is this is this is the problem I think partly with the NHS is it it claims learning from its mistakes, but keeps making the same mistakes year after year after year. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, it, to me, it, this sounds like, I mean, it's so kind of fundamental, but it's, it's like so overlooked. I mean, I, coming from sort of a medical background, it's it's barely touched on in, in sort of medical training, and yet it's so important. And having done ITU, I feel so grateful that this is something that I've sort of come across a bit, um, more from the anaesthetic side of things, in managing these difficult situations. And it, it just makes a huge difference, really. Um, I mean, I, I feel like this is the sort of thing that maybe they should sort of teach in some part of medical school. Um, you know, we're all there learning about, you know, Krebs cycle or whatever, but actually this is the sort of thing that's probably a lot more important to day to day, kind of doing the job well. I, I'd agree, Ricky. I mean, there is there is there are moves to start trying to get this into med school. Um, but again, it's sort of it's it's an afternoon in five years. It, it's not really anything that's going to teach you a great deal. It's something that needs to be repeated. Um, and at, at different stages, if you look at this, the sort of the courses, I, I, I run these for surgeons. Um, the deanery on the surgery side, so the School of Surgery has deemed that two courses a year should cover the whole of the East Midlands for surgery. Um, so unless I'm doing about 400 people on a on a team's course twice a year, we're going to miss an awful lot of people. Um, so uh, it, it's difficult to try and get this information. And if you are a CT1, CT2, more junior, a lot of the course will be giving information to, to you as, as a trainee because this is stuff you've not come across before. Whereas if you are ST7, ST8 coming to your CCTs, a lot of this you'll be used to using and it's you're shifting the focus in those courses to how are you going to actually manage it? How are you going to use it? What are your experiences in theatres? So there's a slight different onus on the courses, but those courses I think should run throughout throughout the courses, throughout the years, and certainly through med school. Uh, I, to be honest, the amount that's coming through from med school now is is shockingly different compared to when you and I went through, Ricky. Um, and I think it's possibly that we haven't quite got... Way. Sorry? Shockingly different in a good way. In a good way, yeah. So they're actually getting, if you if you were to ask the med students now, they're, they're getting... So when I started doing um, this of the critical instance stuff in anaesthetics, when I did the first couple of years, which was a little while ago, um, I used to show people the Elaine Bromley video. Um, and over the last couple of years, people have got so fed up with listening, they used to put it on and they go, oh, not this video again. Um, and it's that's, that, that's OK, it's, it's not ideal, but um, but they, they're finally getting some teaching at that level. The, the issue is I think that they haven't, those medical students and those junior doctors haven't quite made it through to positions of power yet. And when they do, that's hopefully when things will start to change a little bit faster. Um, but it's, it's, it's having, it's building it from the bottom up mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it will take a bit of time, but it will get there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's, that's good to hear. Good to hear. Um, so we've, got medical, we've got a medical student who doesn't agree with you. Got a different opinion from a med student. Well, as, as we all know, my communication is awful, so I'm not going to listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you're on call next week, aren't you? I emailed you about the student, right? <laughs> as I said, my communication is excellent, so I don't, rec I don't remember that email, Jenny. Oh, Excellent. No, I think I think it, I think it's something that just needs to keep going on and on and on. Um, the northeast, the northwest of England at the present time are leading this. I've I've been involved in eleven courses this year. And I think they've done twenty online courses for all surgical specialties. So the surgical side of things, and that, but that's they have a patient safety. Their patient safety lead happens to be. Uh, head of education for the surgery for the northeast. So he's very engaged in it, but has, has actually got worked out funding for all of that. So there are probably going to be 30 odd, 30, 35, 40 courses a year just for surgeons in the northwest. But that's what it's going to have to take to get the to get everybody through them. So you get these exposures constantly. I don't think medicine has anything like it. And if you do, by the time you've actually managed to get a lead, you've probably fallen out of most of the departments. Yeah, and that's the problem. And then you get 
Yeah. James, what it's not think? easy. I was just going to say, but actually, I think how you said that it sort of tick pocket exercise and people run a course and it's like we picked it like from my impression at least that's a lot of the school. It feels like that's how they do it. Okay. They always take these days right after our exams. So you would have an exam on Friday and they bring you in at 9 a.m. the following Monday to do the patient safety. So everyone is exhausted. No one cares. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, but you've attended today now, we're never going to talk about this again. It's, it's all it's all done. It's so. not relevant to your assessment. Yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, I survived the day. You were just chatting to everyone about how you're so looking forward to the holidays. And how your exam went the week. And no one, I know, yeah, no one asked, you never give a view to a question about yeah. it. It's just like, well, I've survived the day. I've got the tick box. Yeah. And the medical said they've done it. And then you go into the hospital and you see, it's like, oh, yeah, but you know, you get these current consultants, but they're, they're leaving, they're changing. It's all going to change. It's like, well, maybe a little bit. Yeah. I don't, I don't think too much because again, you know, you have to learn about Gilbert syndrome or something ridiculous for the exam that comes up, and then yeah. things that actually matter is just a tick box exercise at the end. So then you're right. It's that. It's that sort of. It's it's deemed to be a single shot immunity, isn't it? You sort of go, I've been on course. I'm all good now. I'm done for the next thirty years of my life. Where it, it's not true. Yeah, it's changing culture. Mike, the part of the problem about that is it's actually incredibly difficult to assess. Um, uh, even by simulation or by um, by step four, when MCQ is SBA or anything else like that. So actually, um, it's it is usually put in a place that you can't assess it. And as you said, it's usually sub shoehorned. Again, as people who are um, who are very much uh, happy teaching and, uh, and and proactive with all of this when they get to positions of power where they will actually take this forward, that will change. I expect we're probably getting into a situation where it's all been new and exciting and it's now got a little bit stayed until um, until it starts being taught in a way that actually makes a difference. But until someone can come along and actually prove to the entire of the NHS that it makes a significant uh, financial benefit to teach it properly, um then it won't change nothing will change yep um okay uh if there's no more questions probably need to get on to the the journal club now but uh thank you very much for that presentation Andy. that's been brilliant uh good afternoon uh i'm ravindra pocharaju i'm a specialty doctor in intensive care unit at glenfield uh, today in the novel paper section of our general club, we're going to be discussing and I'll be presenting this uh, article by Dankiewicz et al. on hypothermia versus normothermia of drought of hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, and this is the same group that did the TTM trial before. So this is for the TTM uh, group. But before we go into the details of this specific article, I thought it might be appropriate to do just a quick recap of what we've been sort of seeing in this field of management of autophospital cardiac arrest patients over the last sort of more than a decade or so. So around sort of 2002 in NEJM, there were two publications relating to management of these patients with hypothermia. One of them was the HAKA trial, the hypothermia after cardiac arrest, and the other was, that was the European trial. And the other was the trial that was done in Australia by Bernard et al. And in both those both of those trials, they've actually caused a sea change in how we manage these patients. And uh, the outcome from those two trials was that uh, therapeutic hypothermia to a range of around 33 degrees centigrade, following a VF cardiac arrest, uh, it improved uh, neurological outcome. So there's more of a favorable neurological outcome in patients who were actually cooled. But then there was some caveats in the outcomes for these trials. One of that is that, uh, as we see, the sample size was quite small in, in, in both of those trials. The evidence, again, was of low certainty because the control group in these two trials was probably treated slightly different. They had more sort of episodes of fever, and they were not sort of completely matched between the, the control group and the study group. Uh, and so, though we have actually taken the outcomes from these trials and caused the change in our management, there were some caveats and some sort of loopholes in the in these two trials, but nonetheless, it has caused a positive impact in how we manage these patients. And then uh, about a decade ago in uh, the TTM trial got published, which again was a major sort of game changer in, in the management of these patients. Uh, TTM 
the trial, they compared targeted temperature management and the temperatures that they chose were 33 degrees and 36 degrees in patients who have autophosphate cardiac arrest or from a presumed cardiac cause. Again, uh, in comparison to the HACA trial and the Bernard trial, they included all, all rhythms in these, uh, in these study groups in this trial. And they reported that there was no significant difference in all-cause mortality, no significant difference in any neurological outcome between the two groups. And that caused a change in the way that we manage these patients nowadays. And we are more or less uh, not stopped cooling these patients. And we are trying to see if we can maintain the temperature at about 36. And that comes from the TTM. Uh, about two years ago, we've got another publication in this field, the Hyperion trial, which showed that in patients who are in coma following cardiac arrest and have a non-shockable rhythm, the use of moderate hypothermia, it improved the neurological outcome at 90 days. Again, this trial also has some problems associated with it in that the control group was not managed similar to the study group. So we can't actually, we have to take it with a bit of, with a pinch of salt on the, the, the outcome that came out from this trial. In the light of all these, We've got the, the European Resuscitation Council guidelines and we had an update in March 2021. And uh, they suggest that uh, in patients who had an autophosphate cardiac arrest, whatever be the rhythm, maintaining a target temperature at a constant value between 32 and 36 for 24, degree, for, for 24 hours is advisable. The evidence is of low certainty, but that is what the European Resuscitation Council recommends. And uh, they do suggest that we should avoid fever uh, fever by definition has a temperature of more than 37.7 degrees centigrade for at least 72 hours post ROSC in patients who remain in coma. The bottom line of all of these is that we know that fever is bad in patients who have had a cardiac arrest because it probably worsens the, the brain injury that has happened and all our efforts have to be to, to mitigate that and avoid uh, uh, periods of sort of hypocalaxia or high temperatures. So coming to the TTM2 trial, so the clinical question that the investigators tried to answer was, in patients who are unconscious following an autophosphate cardiac arrest, does targeted hypothermia compared with the targeted normothermia impact all-cause mortality? The phrase targeted is quite key to this trial because otherwise we might sort of misinterpret it. And the hypothesis that they made was that at six months, the incidence of death would be lower in the hypothermia group when compared to the normothermia group. So the trial design, it was a multi-center randomized international trial, superiority trial. This was done in across sort of at least sort of seven, eight countries, uh, mostly Europe, UK, and I think in few cent two, two centers in the US as well. Uh, there was some uh, uh, co-enrollment with the TAME trial, which is the, the targeted therapeutic mild hypercapnia trial. There was about 10% sort of in both groups that were co-enrolled in the TAME trial as well. Uh, the results of the, the, the TAME trial is not out yet, it is still ongoing. Most of the patients were randomized in the emergency department after, after they come to the hospital post ROSC, and they used a web-based allocation using permuted blocks of varying sizes, and they allocated in one is to one ratio. When it came to blinding, obviously the treating clinicians, it was difficult to blind because we were sort of managing uh, patients and we were targeting temperatures that were told to us. So the clin treating clinicians were not blinded, but they overcome uh, this uh, by uh, blinding everyone else who were participating in the study. So all the assessors of the prognosis of these, uh, who prognosticated these patients, the participants themselves, the outcome assessors, the statisticians and data managers, all of them were blinded into the group allocation of these patients. So this trial, as I said, was sort of across 14 countries, 61 institutes, uh, and the highest recruiting centers have been in Sweden, UK, uh, France, Czech Republic, and in Swiss. Swiss. Uh, the, day, uh, so the trial sort of uh, recruited between 2018 to early 20, 2020, and the, they completed the six month follow-up at about mid 2020. And this, this uh, article got published in, in, in June, uh, this year in, in NEJM. Uh, coming to the inclusion criteria for this trial, it inc they included all patients, uh, adult patients more than 18 years of age, uh, who had an autophosphate cardiac arrest of a presumed cardiac or an unknown cause. And the rhythm was not a criteria. They included patients despite, regardless of the rhythm, all patients uh, who were unconscious 
as defined by a four score motor response of less than four and not able to obey, uh, obey any verbal command was uh, were included. So the four score is similar to GCS, but slightly complicated, but probably more useful. Four stands for full outline of unresponsiveness and it has four components, eye opening, uh, motor response, brainstem reflexes and respiratory pattern. So they used uh, any the uh, score of four for each of these uh, groups was uh, optimal and anything less than four was suboptimal. So they included anyone with a motor score, motor response less than four. Four was normal response. And then the patients also who had a sustained ROSC for more than 20 minutes uh, uh, without any need for chest compressions, uh, that was a prerequisite to include. And uh, they, should, they should also should not have any limitations in care of management in place. And they, uh, they if, if they were sort of passed more than 180 minutes after ROS, they, that was not, those patients were not included. The exclusion criteria were any unwitnessed cardiac arrest with the initial rhythm as a systole, uh, temperature on admission less than 30 degrees centigrade. If they were on ECMO prior to ROS as part of ECPR, they were not included. And patients who are intracranial bleed on admission or who are suspected pregnancy or severe COPD with long-term home oxygen, they were not included in, in the trial. So in total, about 4,000 odd patients were screened and they managed to randomize about 1,900 patients. And the 50% of the patients that did not get randomized, they had a well-defined cause on why they could not randomize those patients. So they met one of these uh, sort of exclusion criteria. Uh, out of the 1,900 patients, uh, they managed to include 1,861 patients. Uh, as an intention to treat population, and they randomized 930 to the hypothermia arm and 931 patients to the normothermia arm. And out of these, 11 patients were lost follow up. So the results are available for about 1850 patients that were included in this trial, and they were analyzed for survival and uh, neurological outcome post survival. So the, uh, so the trial intervention was essentially between uh, hypothermia and normothermia as managing these patients. So the hypothermia group was, uh, the, those patients were immediately cooled to a target temperature of about of 33 degrees centigrade. And that was maintained for 28 hours. And then after that, there was rewarming to 37 degrees in hourly increments of about one third of a degree. The normothermia group, on the other hand, the target temperature was 37.5 degrees uh, Celsius or less. And if conservative management and pharmacological measures, including use of paracetamol, failed to maintain temperature at that level, then uh, the clinicians were at discretion to use active measures to cool those patients, but the cooling was done to 37.5. So if the body temperature reached more than 37.8, then they instituted Sort of surface cooling measures or intravascular devices to cool these patients to 37.5 degrees centigrade. The intervention period was in total about 40 hours in terms of managing these patients from a temperature point of view actively. So that includes 28 hours of them having that target temperature. And then the next 12 hours was sort of uh, to rewarming them in the hypothermia group. Uh, and for both groups, the uh, management of sedation uh, was very well protocolized and it was mandated until the end of intervention period. And after the intervention period, a normal thermic target between 36.5 and 37.7 was maintained until 72 hours after randomization in patients who remained uh, sedated or comatose. The cooling devices that were commonly used in these patients, 70% of the patients who required cooling, uh, they, uh, they used surface devices, which is similar to the Arctic Sun that we use in our trust. About 30% of the patients, uh, they used intravascular cooling devices, which, which were associated with slightly more complications uh, when compared to the, to the surface devices. And the outcomes that they assessed were, the primary outcome was death from any cause at six months. The secondary outcome, the main secondary outcome was a poor functional outcome at six months. The functional outcome again was assessed by a modified ranking scale by people who were actually well-trained in assessing these, these outcomes. So they were well-trained uh, to do this assessment and the assessment involved a structured questionnaire to evaluate the patient's condition after, after this, uh, 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 at the end of 
uh, six month period. Obviously, COVID pandemic happened around the same time. So a full structured assessment could not be completed for some patients. So they modified the Rankin scale and uh, into a binary outcome. We'll go into the Rankin scale briefly. So it's, it's a zero to six scale, zero being perfectly normal conditions and six is a patient who is dead. So anything between zero to three is a reasonably favorable outcome and four to six is obviously bad. So for patients whom, uh, who did not have a full structured assessment, the outcome was sort of made on a based, of, based on a telephone interview and the Rankin scale was, uh, there was a binary division in that it was either zero to three, meaning a good good outcome, and four to six, meaning a poor outcome. Uh, so if the face-to-face -face, uh, assessment was not possible, telephone interviews was resorted to. Again, this was as a result of COVID pandemic, which happened, which is sort of evolving at the time when this assessment was done for this trial. Uh, so the outcomes in cardiac arrest patients, the not first cardiac arrest patients, essentially the patients die before because of withdrawal. That's the most common cause of death in, in these patients. And uh, the mortality and the outcome is essentially a self-fulfilling prophecy, depending upon the treat clinicians that are treating these patients. Uh, so for this trial, the assessment of phenological prognosis and withdrawal of life support was very well protocolized. So at 96 hours after randomization or later, the physician who was unaware of these of the intervention assessments, they performed a neurological assessment of these patients. And all decisions about withdrawing life-sustaining therapy were at the discretion of the treating physicians. And after assessment of neurological prognosis, withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies were made if we presume that a poor neurological outcome was going to happen from that particular patient. And the way that they assessed these uh, neurological prognosis was by a combination of three criteria. One was a clinical assessment of the patient. Two was uh, uh, involving tests, uh, which included uh, uh, any two between EEGs, CT scans, MRIs, assessment of neuron-specific NLAs, SSCPs. So they had to have two of these six tests to show an unfavorable outcome. And then third one was uh, the patient had uh, no evidence of ongoing uh, coma from a sedation point of view, if they, uh, as in ruling out organ dysfunction, which was caused contributing to coma. So they had to meet all these three criteria. And then they came to a conclusion that the patient, whether the patient had a favorable or an unfavorable neurological outcome from, from the cardiac arrest. And uh, this is a histogram showing uh, when they actually uh, uh, withdrew the life sustaining therapies. So most of the, from the histogram on the left, it's, it looks like most of it happened around day five, which is common practice in what we do as well. But most of the patients by day 10, the decision was made in terms of uh, withdrawing uh, life sustaining uh, therapies. And on the right, uh, the randomization period was around, so, so the decision-making period was about 96 hours after randomization. So any withdrawal after that was essentially from a neurological cause, which was from the clinical assessment and the, clin and the uh, exam from, examination from various other investigations that were done. And uh, the, the orange bits before that, the withdrawal was essentially due to causes other than uh, neurological outcome other than poor neurological sort of uh, features in these patients. So they, uh, they calculated the power, uh, the power calculation was based on the fact that to reach a power of 90% with a number needed to treat of 13, they will need to have about 1,862 participants for this trial, but then they increased it to 1,900 to account for loss of, uh, to account for loss, secondary to loss of follow-up. The principal trial analysis was performed in the intention to treat population and it was analyzed through a Cox regression model and a p-value of less than 0.05 was considered to indicate such statistical significance for the primary outcome. And secondary outcomes were presented between with 95% conf confidence intervals because they were more of a assessment point of view, it was a structured questionnaire that was used and they were not adjusted for any multiplicity. Um, and all of these analysis was performed using uh, this language and environment for statistical computing methods. So 
if you look at the results, the baseline characteristics of the intention to treat population between the hypothermia and normothermia group, they were very, very well matched in terms of demographics, past medical problems, the cause of the cardiac arrest, including the location, the initial rhythm, they were very well matched between the two, two groups. Uh, and uh, if you look at the median time of uh, to ROSC, from cardiac arrest, it was also very well matched. It was 25 minutes between the two groups. Uh, so this was the uh, this is a graph showing how they uh, the investigators manage these targeted temperature managements in these uh, in the in both the groups. In the hypothermia group, uh, about 95% of the patients received cooling with a device, and it was about three hours. A median of three hours was the time that was taken to reach a temperature of 34 and below. In the normothermia group, about 46% of the patients received cooling with the device, though so the exact numbers on how many patients actually developed fever is not completely clear from this trial. But because they set a temperature of 37.8 as the target, so that was the 428 was the, pay, was the number that was given in the, in the study where the patients received some type of cooling with the device. Uh, the cooling device, as I said earlier, was predominantly surface cooling, and but about 30% of the patients uh, needed some intravascular cooling as well. And in terms of recording temperature for these patients, because the intervention period was about 40, 40 hours from the time of randomization, there were about 41 temperature recordings that were possible, and the median number of temperature recordings was 38 in both the groups. And most commonly measured, the way of measuring the temperature in this trial was using a bladder probe to measure the temperature. If that was not available, esophageal probes were used uh, to measure temperatures, which is probably similar to, to the nasopharyngeal probe that we insert uh, for, for management in our trust. So if you look at the outcomes uh, between the two groups uh, for this trial, there was no significant difference in the six month all cause mortality between uh, both arms, the hypothermia arm and the normothermia arm. Uh, about 50% of the patients in the hypothermia arm survived, and that was about 48% in, in the normothermia arm. So the, uh, maybe the people in the, uh, who were randomized to the normothermia arm slightly survived better, but then that was not statistically significant. And if you look at the secondary outcomes based on the modified ranking scale, uh, assessing the functional outcome, again, a, uh, a poor functional outcome from a modified ranking scale was also almost equal between the two groups. And as was the quality of life, which was assessed at six months using the, uh, the EQVAS scoring. Uh, there were pre-specified uh, adverse events in this trial, and some of them were uh, complications relating to pneumonia, skin complications, bleeding, sepsis, and hemodynamic instability. So those were the, the adverse events which were, which were uh, mentioned in the beginning of the trial, out of which, apart from arrhythmias relating to hemodynamic instability, all the other complications were more or less similar in, in both groups. Now, we know that hypothermia can cause a degree of myocardial irritability and can cause arrhythmia. Uh, and that is that is not something which is completely uh, new. And and in this uh, in this trial, uh, evidently that happened more in the hypothermic group. But again, that that's, that that shouldn't come as a surprise. And there were five defined predefined subgroups in this trial. And the subgroups that were defined were on the basis of sex, age, um, a time to ROS from the cardiac arrest, what was the initial rhythm and whether there was shock and admission. Shock and admission was defined as a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, raised lactate or a heart rate of less than 60. Again, between those five subgroups, the outcomes were completely matched between the two groups. So there was no difference at all in terms of death or uh, functional outcome as defined by a uh, modified ranking scale. Uh, again, this is the kaplan mayer show, curve showing the probability of survival until 180 days after randomization. And they are more or less matched. Normal thing looks like slightly better, but again, that was not statistically significant. So in conclusion, uh, in this trial of hypothermia versus normothermia after autophospital cardiac arrest, uh, hypothermia did not lead to a lower six-month incidence of death when compared to normothermia. Uh, 
and the functional outcome and health related quality of life also did not improve from hypothermia. So it, it basically says that there was no difference between the two uh, and patients are better off even when they're managed uh, to at temperatures of less than 37.5 when compared to 33. This trial has quite a few strengths to it. It was an excellently conducted randomized trial, large numbers, almost close to 1900 across multiple countries. So there was significant external and external validity to it because it was a multi-center trial and done across multiple centers in different countries. There was robust sample size uh, and an estimate of absolute risk reduction was about 7.5%. The mortality in this trial was similar to, uh, or 50% was similar to what was assumed in their power calculations. So they matched to that. And the trial had excellent internal validity as well, because uh, uh, though there was issues which they could not circum circumvent in terms of blinding the treating clinicians, they managed to do significant blinding to people who were trying to assess the outcomes of these patients. So that was completely blinded. It was the intention to treat analysis. There was clear separation between the groups and an almost near complete follow-up with just 11 patients being lost uh, to follow up. So it was almost a near complete follow-up. Uh, and uh, the, the care of these patients was quite well protocolized between the groups across all these multiple centers across different countries in order to minimize variability in practice. And most of these centers that, that recruited these patients were, were cardiac arrest centers who, who, do, who do this uh, on a day in day out basis. So they are, uh, uh, the time to cooling was also fairly short in uh, all of these centers. But there are a few weaknesses as well. For one, when compared to uh, TTM1, which showed that there was no significant difference between 33 and 36, their assumption of uh, having a reduct absolute risk reduction of 7.5 looked a bit ambitious, but then that was based on the, the Haka trial and the Bernard trial. They did not include the TTM1 trial to, 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 uh, to arrive at a absolute risk reduction of 7.5. It, it, the, from the trial, it is not exactly clear how many patients in the normothermia group developed temperature. It says that about 40-45% needed cooling, but there are graphs in the supplementary appendix. Again, it's not clear from those graphs how many percentage of patients in the normothermia group developed fever. Uh, uh, the trial does not answer the question as to whether any ultra-cooling, ultra-early cooling might be beneficial, but as I said, all of these centers were cardiac arrest centers who do this on a regular basis. And the median time to cooling was about three hours, which is probably as fast as we could get in any other center elsewhere in the world. Uh, obviously, it doesn't say anything about in-hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, and uh, and there, was, there is an element of confounding as well, because 20% of the patients, 10% in each group were co-enrolled in the the hypercapnia trial, the mild hypercapnia trial as well at the same time. So unless we know the results of that trial, we could sort of assume that there was some element of confounding factors that was involved because these patients were recruited into two trials at the same time. The coming to the fact that when I asked the question, will this change my practice? Probably yes to, the, uh, to an extent that I'll probably start to aim for a temperature of 37.5 as opposed to 36 up until now. I will still implement targeted temperature management in if the temperature exceeds 37.5. Uh, but the, the biggest take home message from for me from this trial is that we should not take the results of this trial as if uh, and consider that we can now start to ditch the Arctic sun or ditch targeted temperature management forever. I think the the target temperature management is still the key. It's just that the goal post of the target has moved from, from 33 to 36 to 37.5 now. Uh, and if you look into this trial into more details on how they manage these patients, uh, there were very strict protocols on how they managed the sedation and how they neurologically prognosticated these patients at well-defined times. And probably that is the key as well if you have to uh, uh, follow the out, uh, if you have to aim at the outcomes that come from this trial and imitate them into our practice, I think you need to do a combination of 
proper targeted temp uh, uh, temperature management along with protocolized care involving appropriate sedation practices and correct neuroprognostication in these patients uh, uh, to, to match the outcomes that, that were there in this trial. Uh, but I would still sort of uh, use targeted temperature, but probably I will aim for a temperature of 37.5 uh, uh, rather than 36 or 33. I don't think the temperature as such matters as, as long as we are doing a, a targeted temperature management and making sure that the patients don't become febrile. I think that that is the key in the management of these patients. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Atul. Uh, I'm one of the ICU fellows at Glenfield Hospital. Uh, the second journal for discussion is the HEAT trial, which has uh, come in and gem in 2015. It's basically comparing uh, paracetamol for fever in critically ill patients. It's a placebo controlled trial. Uh, before going to the trial, I would like to, to go into the history. Uh, so in, uh, in 1896, actually, William Osler told that Humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. And of these, by far the greatest and by far the most terrible is fever. He goes on to equate it to like three years of famine and seven years of war and so forth. So there was no paracetamol at that time. Okay, and we were, as clinical medicine evolved, we were using fever as a defense mechanism as well, I would say. Comes in like 1930s uh, with the use of the pyrotherapy where, uh, are you seeing the, uh, yeah, this guy here is called Julius Wagner Jorek. He's an Austrian psychiatrist actually. He used uh, fever as a uh, treatment, I would say. So the patient here uh, is having neurosyphilis and at that time, there were no, not much treatment. There was no penicillins or antibiotics for syphilis. So what he did was he inoculated blood from malaria patients to the patients who was having syphilis. And then he like made them febrile and that cleared the syphilis. So, so he was awarded actually the Nobel Prize in 1927 for his discovery that like malaria inoculation in the treatment. So we were using fever as a, a therapeutic option as well. Moving on in 1930s, it, it was the Kettering hypertherm. This was actually in US Naval Hospital where uh, we were, we were, patients were actually warmed like to 40 de 42 degrees Celsius for seven hours. It was for the treatment of gonorrheal infections. And this is one of the nurses who's caring for the patient. This, looking like an oven here with some fans and some tepid sponging, I believe. Yeah, so we were using a uh, um, fever as a treatment option. We have got many examples in the animal kingdom as well, uh, with chicken and Campylobacter. Uh, the body temperature of chicken is actually like around 42 degrees. And Campylobacter doesn't cause any sickness in that they don't get ill with Campylobacter easily. It's because of their temperature. But once they reach the normal temperature, when we are in contact with the Campylobacter from them, we got sick and diarrhea. There's also this development is more or less like a behavioral fever in honeybees. So when whenever one uh, one of the honeybees get infected with some fungal infection or something, they the honeybees as a group, they increase the temperature of their hive by like repeated, repeated flapping of their wings and they increase the temperature and then they get cured. So we have got all these in animal kingdom, but what, we usually do in clinical practice is like whenever we get a patient on on multiple occasions i've seen like a patient will be having a fever of 37 7 37 8 he must have already had paracetamol by the time you get there because most of the time 
it's in it's written as an asteroid quad medications and probably on uh nothing so much have already administered it so yeah the thing is that there's no no not much placebo controlled trials comparing pa paracetamol with placebo and uh, their influence on our practice so that's the importance of this heat trial it's done in um, the icus in new zealand and australia in 2015 early 2012 to 15 multi ct it's a blinded trial placebo control as i've told has got two arms paracetamol group and placebo group the paracetamol group received one gram of paracetamol every six hours and the placebo group was not getting paracetamol the outcome the main outcome measure was the icu free days with what they meant is the the days they are alive and free from the need of intensive care from the day they are randomized to day 28. so the inclusion criteria was simple uh, temperature more than 38 degree and known or suspected infections they have excluded central fevers from from this trial or there were a definite cessation criteria as well. This was like when the patient is discharged from ICU, they're out of the trial, resolution of fever, cessation of antibiotics, and obviously death. So this is how they did it. They had like 3,600 who met the inclusion criteria. They excluded 1,600 of them because many had contraindications to oh, paracetamol, brain injury, hypothermic syndrome, and so forth. And out of it, 700 were randomized to two groups, the paracetamol and the placebo group. And 346 were included to the paracetamol group and the 348 for the placebo group. The good thing about this trial is they have accounted for every, every, every patient who was included and randomized in this trial. And these are the study outcomes that have found so in the paracetamol group the primary outcome was uh, the icu free days was 23 days and in the placebo was 22 so it's not much of difference there they also looked into the key secondary outcomes like the hospital free days the days free from mechanical ventilation actually these are, these were all like subgroup analysis like the days free from inotropic support renal replacement days free from icu support they were all actually the same i would say not much of a difference so so it's is it cool to be hot is the question i'm not going to the main details and statistical analysis it's mainly for our for a discussion for regarding our clinical practice whether we we are going to be very strict with the fever or do we allow them to be a bit hot from from my perspective uh, the patients who are in icu are actually in a lot of physiological stress and they are also already decompensated so those mechanisms that are uh, applicable to the like the healthy individuals may not be true to our set of patients because fever is we know that it increases the metabolic rate, it increases the heart rate, increases oxygen consumption, CO2 production, it increases the myocardial workloads, vasodilatory effects. So it's not really ideal for ICU patients to be like very febrile. But on the other hand, uh, having some temperature studies has shown that it has got an enhanced immune cell function when the body temperature is high. It inhibits the pathogenic growth, decrease viral shedding, and increase, and even our antibiotics works better when, when, when it's on the higher temperature. From my, from my practice, I think I would suggest that we should strike a balance between giving paracetamol. I'm not against giving paracetamol, but it's left to the discussion mainly. That's it. Thank you very much, Athol. Um, any comments from from people? I, I mean, I, I personally think that's a really interesting thing to present. It it does, you know, you, you sort of almost give paracetamol without thinking when someone's got a temperature because that's you know one of the things we've always done. But 
we don't know if that's the right right thing to do. Um, I don't know what sort of other people think, but I think you make very good points about you know the. I, I guess sort of my thoughts about the advantages of, of controlling that temperature are you know the the, um, the physiological stresses kind of maintaining that temperature puts on somebody. Um, mm. But equally, yeah, as you say, you know we, you know we're we're fighting against you know millions of years of evolution which we've evolved to get a temperature so i don't quite know what's right actually um any thoughts from anyone else mike little go for it the way i normally look at it is is patient comfort so if you've got a patient that's awake um, and, and having a significant pyrexia or having rigors that are actually very uncomfortable then controlling the temperature makes sense um I think having a patient who is, uh, but the use of paracetamol on that is, is, is worthwhile and also as analgesic. But when it's uh, something that you've got an asleep patient to actually a change in temperature, um, if anything, you're treating the medical and the nursing side of it, then uh, I think the issue there is that you're almost doing it automatically and Part of me thinks that it, it's it, you're just giving it to make yourself feel better, but at the same time, I wouldn't want it to be then missed out if uh, such time as the patient awakes and uh, and they need something. So it's 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 a bit of a it's probably it's not it's not doing too much harm just to have it there, uh, but if anything, you are just making yourself feel better. Any other thoughts from anyone else? Yeah, I mean, there's some lovely animal studies. I think it was rabbits where they perforated their guts and they uh, gave them per all peritonitis and then randomised them into temperature control and not. That showed um, that those that had that weren't didn't have their fever suppressed had a much higher reduction in their bacterial replication rate. And they've done a similar thing with viral um, shedding as well. So if you think, for example, you take, for example, COVID, your viral shedding is, is reduced by the presence of a fever. I completely agree. If you're uncomfortable, you've got a reason to treat it like because the patient's unwell. That like, is uncomfortable. Or I think the other situation that is worth treating is if someone is so um, fragile from a um, uh, you know, sort of they can't tolerate a fever because it'll increase their cardiac output and they don't have the reserve to manage that and they might fall in a complete heap. Then I think those patients as well, you might consider treating their fever. But I think part of the reason for presenting it was to challenge the sort of the the um, almost unthought about thing of just giving paracetamol and treating fever all the time in all our intubated, ventilated patients who aren't uncomfortable and don't have pain. Um, and that actually maybe it is physiologically helpful and that we shouldn't do it. No, I, think, I think that's a very good point, really. I think you're right. I think there are some of these interventions that we, we just do because we've, we've always done. Um, but yeah, in terms of, sort of the evidence behind that, it, it does sort of raise the question, really. Um, any other comments from anyone else? Otherwise, I think we'll probably finish up there. Uh, I think Devon has put a link to the feedback uh, in the, the chat, so if you could all uh, kindly click on onto that. Um, but I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much, everyone.